let's start. Um, okay, so let's start. Um, hello, and welcome to the Bristol's Chaos Dark Matter Conference presented by me, um, Harry. I am the Astro Rep for Chaos, and I'm joined by Eden, who is our talks rep. Hello. Um, this evening, we'll be discussing the current model of dark matter and alternatives with three brilliant scientists, world famous names here, Dr. Gary Mammon and Professors Lysia Verda and Carlos Frank. Uh, Dr. Gary Mammon is a senior astronomer in the Institute of Astrophysics in Paris. He analyzes the internal motions of galaxies, galaxy clusters, and star clusters to constrain the distribution of dark matter and detect black holes. Uh, he also works on the mechanisms for suppressing or boosting the fertility of galaxies to form stars. He's involved in the Euclid satellites whose mission is to unveil the nature of dark matter. Dark energy, sorry. Lysia is the lead researcher of the Physical Cosmology Group at the ICC, as well as professor at the Catalan Institution of Research and Advanced Studies. She has won numerous honours and awards such as the 2018 Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics with the WMAP team, as well as the 2015 Thompson's Reuters ISI Highly Cited Researcher, which is, the award, is awarded to the top 1% most cited researchers in her field. And uh, last but not least, we have Carlos, who is the founding director of the Institute of Computational Cosmology at Durham University. Uh, the ICC are a world-renowned research group uh, leading in the simulation of cosmological structures. Uh, Carlos has been recently awarded both a CBE and the Max Born Prize in recognition of his incredible contribution to physics. He, is all, he was also included as one of the world's most influential scientific minds in 2015. This evening, we are proud to be raising money for the charities Gavi Sight Savers and the SJD Barcelona Children's Hospital, which is leading the way in both children's and maternal health care. Gavi is a charity that works to vaccinate the world's children to protect them against deadly diseases and Sight Savers helps to prevent blindness in those living in poorer countries. Any money that would have gone to cover the costs of our speakers travel um, will be donated instead in aid of these charities. Uh, well, without further ado, let us pass over to Gary to discuss his research and give us a brief history of dark matter. Okay. Do you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Do. Thank you. Okay, so I'll give you a brief history. I'm going to be a, give a very basic talk and I'll give you the view from galaxies. So this first picture, the, in, the inset picture is a view of our neighbor galaxy Andromeda, which looks a, a little bit like ours, not exactly. And the outer picture is a simulation in which uh, Carlos was involved, um, which shows the dark matter distribution. And you see lots of little dark matter clumps, which we don't see in the picture because the little dots that you see in the picture, the big dots are galaxies, satellite galaxies, but little dots are foreground stars. So let's start from the basics. Uh, Newton uh, told us that gravity works as a gravitational force, which goes as inverse of the square distance. Okay, Gra uh, gravi gravi uh, gravitational acceleration is roughly constant on Earth, so you have uni uniformly accelerated motions. But when you go to large scales, you use this formula on the lower left. And that, and you deduce from that, and well, actually, he explained the elliptical orbits that uh, Kepler found. And uh, with that, he was able to weigh the sun. All right. So the idea is that uh, the uh, acceleration on the left, which is the centripetal acceleration when you turn around a circle, when you revolve around a circle, is equal to the force per unit mass, which is on the right. And um, and you can do the same to weigh the Earth using the moon, etc. Now, gravity, uh, by its nature of this one over R square force, uh, works on all scales, but in particular on small scales. And so this means that uh, objects agglomerate. Um, they give a, um, 
inner dense regions, like uh, so you can see here are star clusters, galaxies, spiral galaxies, clusters of galaxies. And then the question is, how do we weigh these astronomical objects and can we infer extra matter compared to what is visible? Okay. And uh, let me start with the historical uh, progress that was made. And so to understand that, um, imagine that you have a system which is not rotating, but which is uh, what we call pressure supported. So the orbits are, are random. And you can uh, assume that uh, the distribution of orbits has a, a standard deviation, which we call dispersion, in, in the, so in the velocities. And you can work out the kinetic energy um, uh, which, uh, which has a three half term because the, uh, the velocities are measured in a single direction. And you can, uh, and we have a good approximation for the potential energy for finite mass systems. And then you can use what we call the virial theorem, which says that twice the kinetic energy plus the potential energy is zero for a stationary system. So that allows you to calculate the mass in terms of the size and the velocity dispersion squared. So in 1933, Fritz Zwicky, a Swiss astronomer, uh, applied this to the coma cluster, which you see here. So the coma cluster has uh, two very giant galaxies and you know, surrounded by very many tiny galaxies. So he applied the virial theorem and perhaps to his surprise, he found that the mass was about 400 times that predicted by the luminosity of the stars, of the galaxies, sorry. So he knew that uh, galaxies have stellar mass to luminosity ratios of a given value. And so uh, he was surprised that the galaxies in the cluster were moving so fast that he was getting 400 times more mass than predicted. And so he talked about uh, uh, dunkle matter, dark matter. Okay. And in fact, the idea of dark matter uh, was first uh, used in, in astrophysics literature, in modern astrophysics literature, a year before by a fellow called Jan Oort. Now, um, Let's go to uh, rotating objects, which actually are simpler, because there the uh, uh, you can, in principle, um, uh, write the uh, mass in, in terms of the uh, uh, velocity and, and the radius, and it goes pretty much the same thing. It's size times velocity squared over the gravitational constant, and. Uh, and because the distribution of light in spiral galaxies is very concentrated to the center and it falls off exponentially, you could assimilate it to a solar system type of object where all the mass would be concentrated in the center. And for this, we know that the velocity should fall off as one over the square root of distance. And uh, instead, what we found and what Vera Rubin found was um, uh, what in the 70s were flat rotation curves, so that the velocities in the outer regions were faster than predicted. And uh, even before she found this, there were already signs of this in the in the data. And so in the in, uh, 74, there were two papers that came out at the same time saying, well, this means that there must be a distribution of mass around the spiral galaxies, which is invisible and which falls off much more in a much more shallow manner, uh, one over r squared rather than exponentially. And so we call this a halo of dark matter. Now, in spheroidal systems, we have three different ways of doing this. So spheroidal systems don't have rotation usually, so they just have these random motions. So you can use Newtonian dynamics. And when you do this, you have a complicated equation called the Jeans equation, which was first derived by Maxwell, by the way. And the Jeans equation says that the divergence of a pressure tensor is the density times the potential gradient with a minus sign. So what is the pressure tensor? It just relates the, the velocities. Uh, so it's a measure of the velocity dispersions. So the square of the velocity dispersions times the density. So it's like a dynamical pressure. And so physically what this means is that the inner dynamical pressures are larger than the outer dynamical pressures. So a shell of matter would be pushed out by this extra pressure inside, but the gravity is pushing towards the inside and it balances the pressure. So that's Newtonian dynamics. Then you can go to hydrodynamics and you can apply this to the hot gas that shines in the X-rays in clusters of galaxies, for example. And there it's much easier because um, there's no anisotropic pressure. The pressure is isotropic. And so you can reduce it to a, 
to a scalar. And so you just have the gradient of the pressure is the minus the density times the potential gradient. So it's pretty much the same equation. And so if you can figure out the pressure and the pressure is the density times the temperature, then you can also solve for the mass because the mass is encoded in the potential gradient, which goes as for a spherical system as GM over R squared. So the GM of R over R squared. So that's the second method. The third method is to use general relativity. So in one nutshell, what general relativity says is that where there's mass, there's curvature, and where there's curvature, there's mass. So if you can see the signs of the curvature, that means that you have mass that is lensing the, the, the light from the background. So what you see on the left uh, figure is a, a blue arc. I don't know if you see my, my arrow, but this blue arc is a background galaxy which, who's a, which, is, which would look like a, a small spiral galaxy, but who, which is completely distorted by the Einstein effect, okay? And so this is gravitational lensing, and, and the more distorted it is, the more mass there is. And so gravitational lensing is a very powerful tool to measure mass distributions. And the fourth method is particle physics. So in uh, several uh, models of dark matter where they tend to be uh, massive particles, these particles might annihilate when they meet. And, um, and so when they annihilate, they emit gamma rays. And then we can try to detect the gamma rays. And um, so this is, this is starting, has started a few years ago and the new detectors coming up now. So let me go to the method by motions, which is pretty much in my field. And this figure on the left shows uh, a mixture of the analysis of a single galaxy, um, which, is, which was once called the normal elliptical galaxy. But some people even say that it's not elliptical, that it might be a disk galaxy with a, with a big bulge and no, and no gas, as, uh, what we call an S0. But anyway, so the, um, the, um, the, the colored uh, uh, symbols, so uh, Wyman's, the Lorenzi, Douglas, Romanowski, the green curves, uh, the pink shaded region, they're all analysis of the same object. And, they, uh, and when you go far out, they disagree by factors of, 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 of two. And uh, so this shows you how difficult it is to analyze uh, even using internal kinematics. So they're not using all the same tracers. And, uh, and Romanowski et al, they, they, they made the green curves and they, and they made the, uh, the, the, uh, the upper limit, the green upper limit, and they concluded there was a lack of dark matter in elliptical galaxies. But in fact, their green curves, as I noticed, actually were consistent with the predictions, which at the time I thought were the blue curve. Um, now let me move to the fact that when you analyze this for many galaxies of different mass, you see that the dark matter fraction um, depends on the galaxy mass. And interestingly, it has a minimum at some characteristic mass, which we think we understand because the general um, total content uh, of galaxies also has a minimum at some characteristic mass. And then we can go to lower masses and we can span the full range of masses. So here I'm plotting mass over luminosity. So this is luminosity in the infrared, which is a decent proxy for stellar mass. So we're really plotting total mass over stellar mass versus stellar mass to first order. And it has this U-shape curve, just like the dark matter fractions has. And, um, and what you see is that the lowest mass objects called dwarf spheroidals and then the red points called ultra faint dwarfs have incredible amounts of dark matter in them, okay? And so in fact, these are ideal tests, test beds ideal laboratories to, to test the nature of dark matter. And uh, if you zoom on the, on the bright objects, then you find that there's also color dependence. Okay? And, uh, and there's also concentration of dark matter also depends on color. Then I move on to this object. So this object is very interesting. Um, it's one of them, it's, it's, this figure will show in every review of dark matter. And what this shows is a, a composite view of two clusters merging together. So the, the, um, the, the orange uh, circles, if you wish, or whatever, or the, the, the blobs, the, the diffuse objects you see are, come, come from an optical picture. So there you're seeing the stars. So you're, you're seeing to, to first order the stellar mass. The pink regions show you the hot gas. And, uh, and then the hydrodynamical analysis tells us that the hot gas is much more massive than the mass in stars. 
And um, the, the blue regions show you the total mass that you obtain from gravitational lensing, from weak gravitational lensing. And what it shows is that the total mass is decoupled with the dominant hot gas mass. And so this means that is another very nice proof of dark matter, okay, because it's decoupled. So I will conclude um, with uh, a summary, which is that dark matter appears necessary for many things. Rapid, ra ra rapid random motions of stars in dwarf spheroidal galaxies and also in massive elliptical galaxies, rapid rotation of the outer regions of spiral galaxies, which is the same thing, uh, rapid motions of, of, uh, of galaxies in clusters of galaxies, the hot gas in the outer regions of clusters of galaxies, the gravitational lensing masses, um, the decoupled mass from dominant hot gas in the bu bullet cluster, and then, as uh, you might hear from Carlos, um, the cold dark matter initial conditions, and also from Alicia, that see the large scale galaxy distribution that we uh, the, the, in, in the local universe. And what we'll hear from Alicia, how the cosmic microwave background temperature fluctuation spectrum is a, is a proof of dark matter. And just to finish, just one uh, caveat, which is that. Okay, so dark matter dominates the mass of the universe. It's about 85% of the mass of the, of the universe, but we don't know what it's made of and the dark matter particles have escaped detection so far. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gary. I Gosh, think the questions will come afterwards, right? Yes, um, I, I will say now, though, we're, we're trialing a mentimeter for questions. If it, if it doesn't work, everyone, then we can um, allow you to access the chat and you can ask your questions there. But I've posted on the chat um, the link to menti.com and then you input that code and you should be able to ask your questions there and upvote other people's questions. So please use that. Anyway, anyway I'll stop sharing. And I'll go through the chat and see how it goes. But thank you. And, and now, um, as Gary said, we'll pass over to Lysia, um, who will talk to us about um, cold dark matter. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Good. All right, so let me do this magic of uh, sharing the screen. Um, this is... Uh, okay, how can I not share the screen now? It's working. Uh, yes. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So uh, thank you for uh, inviting me here. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. So let uh, me uh, keep on going. You know, uh, Dark Matter even made it in uh, XKCD comics. So if you want to remember how much Dark Matter we expect to have around, this uh, comics will remind you that basically in term of mass, it means that air contain one squirrel worth of Dark Matter at any given time, but it's not any particular squirrel. So I'll uh, talk about some more evidences for dark matter. And I will not go necessarily in chronological order. I will try to go more in some logical order, if, uh, if we can call it logical. And uh, in what follows, I will try to cater for, uh, for, to cater for uh, different levels. So I, vi I will even show uh, figure from actual scientific papers. So, so, you know, some of you may find something that I say a little bit boring. Some of you may find that they don't understand everything, but I mean, if you don't understand something, don't worry, I'm trying to sort of stretch <laughs> things and even show you actual uh, uh, figures from, from papers. 
So uh, let me go back to something that Gary already introduced, that uh, the way when we look at the very large astronomical or cosmological scale, the way to think about gravity is not much in terms of Newton, but more in terms of the general theory of relativity of, of, uh, of Einstein. And what we perceive as gravity is a deformation of the space time, as, as John Wheeler put it very nicely, matter uh, tells space time how to curve and then space time tells matter how to move. The moment you curve space time, then also the path of light doesn't look straight because it will look, it will be the minimal length path in a curve space time. So by to visualize what I mean curve in space time, you may think uh, in two dimension about, you know, putting a, a weight on a uh, soft mattress, but I'm sure some of you have seen this kind of game, even sometimes in airport or train station, where you know you 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 throw a coins around and it keeps orbiting, and this is the way we now understand the orbits in terms of Einstein relativity. Okay, so this brings us to the effect of gravitational lensing. If you if matter bends space time, then what? it's a straight path for light. There's not what you would think will be a straight path on a flat space time. And it's a little bit uh, imagining that when we look at life from far away in the universe, it's like looking through an imperfect glass. So I'm sure you are familiar with uh, windows like this, where you can have either big imperfection here, you can imagine a big lump of matter, or more, much more small and distributed imperfection, and you can imagine this to be the larger scale structure of the universe. And it turns out that, uh, you know, if you have a, a regular lump of mass in front of a distant galaxy, then you would expect to see images like this. And this is what uh, the Hubble Space Telescope actually showed us. If the mass is not perfectly uh, small and regular and not like a point, then you can end up having multiple images of the background object. And if you have a more distributed uh, clumpiness, then you may end up having uh, something like this thing here, where as Gary already showed, this uh, uh, blue arch are distorted images of the same galaxy behind, like in example of the window. Uh, and also you can look at the larger scale distribution of the universe, and this will also bend the light rays, but in a softer way. So uh, again, one can do the same calculation as Gary say, this complex equation that says that uh, the total mass, that is the deformation of space time as Einstein tell us, minus the visible mass, which is what you can see from the light in this uh, cluster of galaxy, gave you something is not zero, and that is the dark matter. Or in other words, you can do a mass to light ratio, which also was introduced by Gary, and find that the mass to light ratio here is of order of hundreds. So there's a lot of more than meet the eye. So there's much more stuff than meets the eye. This is uh, evidence, one, one of the evidences. But uh, I want to switch gear here and talk about the oldest light in the universe. So we know that the universe today is expanding. So if we move the movie backward, if we now we look at this movie backward, we end up at a point where the universe was uh, dense. And when something gets dense, usually get hotter. And so we expect that the universe was born, well, now it's even prime time television in a Big Bang, but the key is in, in, in a hot Big Bang. When things are dense and hot, they emit radiation and the universe was emitting radiation. So uh, in the theory of the Big Bang, it was obvious that there should be pervading the entire universe this uh, radiation, this echo from the Big Bang. It took a while to observe it, and I'm not going to go through the history of the cosmic microwave background, but I'll say that this uh, light, it's not uniform has got a tiny fluctuation which correspond to the primordial perturbation that then due to gravity give rise to the larger scale structure of the galaxies. Uh, so this is the image of this oldest light in the universe where this uh, uh, contrast, this temperature contrast has been improved, uh, 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 
increase the lot so you can actually see it because these perturbation are tiny, are one part in 10 to the five. And the universe is not egg shaped. This is a projection of the celestial sphere on my slide. And you see increasing resolution in the picture of what I call the baby universe uh, from 1992 to 2003 to 2013, these are uh, each of them is a satellite mission, and this is the first picture of their of their, their data released. So this light comes from 380,000 years after the Big Bang. What is interesting about this light are several things. So first, we this are hot and cold spot, which correspond to tiny ripple in density, and are the seeds of galaxy. The detailed statistical properties of these ripples were able to tell us a lot about the universe. And uh, if the universe was hot and dense and like a gas, and this is a ripple in a gas, this is basically like sound, like seeing sound. And I, I like to call this, we like to call this cosmic symphony. But it tells about the composition in the same way as when you knock on something, you can tell whether it's made of wood, whether it's made of uh, stone, or whether it's made of plastic. So a similar thing is, is going on here. And now you see how we are going into the direction of <laughs> what makes up the universe, and there is dark matter. So, um, so what was going on there? So uh, there were potential wells, which uh, you can assume they were made by the matter as we know it he and as we can see so the baryonic matter and if it's the matter as we know it it was coupled to the photons to the radiation and the equation that describe it is very similar to the our force damp harmonic oscillator this potential well that you can see here right you can assume it's made only of the baryonic matter but you can just say well maybe there's something else there and just see what describe the observation and what I need to understand the observations. And so uh, this is this map. And for aficionados, this map can be compressed in something that is called uh, an angular power spectrum. And this correspond to the first contraction of this harmonic oscillator. This is uh, when the two spheres are up again and then down and so on and so forth. But visually, the way to understand this is uh, what uh, the cosmology were able, were started to do in 2008, but this is the latest uh, release, which is, I think it's a much, much higher signal to noise and you can see it much better. So this is taking this map and stacking together a lot of cold spots. And now this is the theory and these are the data and you can see any difference between the theory and the data. And that's exactly the point. So, so let's concentrate it on the cold spot. Around every cold spot, which is uh, a potential well, there is always a hot ring. And believe it or not, it's very, very hard, if not impossible, to actually get a structure like this without putting some dark matter there. If you only have baryonic, ba ba so this, this thing is given by the dark matter and this thing is given by the baryonic matter. You see this uh, two masses here go back up because they are coupled to the photons, but the dark matter is not and it remains in the center, plus two. But there's not just that. Now we have the picture of the baby universe. We see temperature and therefore the normal matter. And leave it evolve for some 13.7 billion years. And you have today's distribution of galaxies, which we have seen with galaxy surveys. And they look things like that. Each little point is a galaxy. So you can imagine the scales you're looking at. And you have to match the perturbation amplitude. You know how much time you had, you know gravity, and you have to grow the perturbation from here to there. And it was pretty obvious since the first detection of those perturbations in 1992 that dark matter is needed as a scaffolding to help this object grow and actually give you the structure that you see today. So, plus three. I won't stop here because um, the seeds of galaxies is a little bit like throwing stone in a pond or the rain, 
we should, and that's the circle you see in there, but we should see the same feature. Should we see the same feature in galaxy distribution? Well, let's see. Uh, let me uh, skip through this, but just say, uh, you should erase these oscillations because that's not what we see. So uh, if by this distribution, you see this, something like that, in this distribution, you don't see these oscillations. If it was only baryonic matter here and no dark matter, today, this, uh, this, the equivalent of this plot would look like something like that, like the dotted line. But in reality, it doesn't. It looks like something like this, which is what is measured and which is what is predicted if you have a lot of dark matter there. Plus four, but not too much because in principle, a little bit of this oscillation that you see up there should remain in the matter distribution, but they are very small. So in order to see them, you have to divide by a smooth function and see if you can see them. The first detection actually was in 2003, so it wasn't that, that easy to detect them. They are really small, but now I show you what is the state of the art today and the line is the theory prediction where you have both baryon and dark matter and the points are the data. So they are detected a very high statistical significance. So if I have another uh, minutes or so, I want to go back to gravitational lensing because now you can try to see the effect of the entire mass or, or ma matter in the entire universe from the first light of the baby universe to today, which is the gravitational lensing of the actual cosmic microwave background radiation of the first light. And uh, without going into much detail, this uh, uh, this the perturbation of this map, this is uh, actually exaggerated, has been detected as expected at 40 sigma level. That's a lot of statistical significance, exactly where you would expect it to be according to the amount of dark matter that all the other evidences so far point you to. So uh, it all hangs together. The, model that we have of the universe, uh, uh, the cosmological model has just six number, but one of them is the dark matter. And I think we can, if you want, you can add this as an extra evidence. And I'll stop here and I'll pass it on to uh, Carlos. Uh, thank you, Disha, uh, for giving your, for the audience an insight into your research. Uh, fast, really fascinating. Uh, and last but not least, we're gonna pass on to Carlos. Is going to give some research, discussing his research on computer simulations of dark matter. Right. <clears throat> so can you see my screen? Uh, not at the moment. Not at the moment. No, of course not, because I haven't shared it. I, I could see it, but um, that's kind of cheating. Right. So um, now let's see. How's that? Oh, that works. That's good. good. All right. Well, so. <clears throat> um, Gary and um, Lich have given you a very nice introduction to the current ideas on dark matter. So just coincidentally, because we didn't really plan this very well, uh, I'm going to um, take off where um, Licha ended. So she showed you a version of this diagram that uh, shows you that um, normal matter makes only 5% of what the universe contains. <clears throat> dark matter, which is different from normal matter. Uh, this is what we refer to as baryonic matter, this is what we refer to as non-baryonic. Dark matter makes up about 25% of what the universe contains. And then the lion's share is dark energy. Now, today we're interested in dark matter, but uh, it is uh, fair to say that we don't really know what the dark energy is. And um, same is true of dark matter, although we have a lot more understanding of dark matter than we do of dark energy. But today we're only interested in this blue part, which in fact is the most interesting in my mind part of the universe. So what is the dark matter? Well, um, we don't know for sure, but um, the key assumption of modern cosmology is that uh, the dark matter is an elementary particle uh, that formed in the early universe, just a second, um, that formed in the early uh, universe 
and it is different from the particles that make ordinary atoms. It's uh, completely different. It's not made of protons and uh, neutrons and electrons. It's something else. Now, the most likely uh, 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 form of this dark matter is um, uh, a particle that was created very early on in the history of the universe, about 10 to the minus 10 seconds after the Big Bang. And in the current model of cosmology, uh, these particles have um, properties that uh, collectively uh, give them the name of cold dark matter. Essentially, they move very slowly at early times, and that's where the name cold dark matter comes from. And there are various candidates from particle physics that would do the job of cold dark matter. So, um, the, um, so the reason why dark matter is so important is not just because it makes up a very substantial fraction of the contents of the universe, but also because it tells us how galaxies form. So it is the gravity of the dark matter that drives the formation of cosmic structure in the universe. And that without dark matter, there would be uh, no galaxies, there would be no stars, there would be no planets, and therefore there would be no people here listening to the three of us telling you about dark matter. So uh, how does that work? Well, Licha very nicely explained that um, we know what the initial perturbations in the universe look like from the microwave background radiation. She didn't quite tell you this, but the origin of these fluctuations that we see here uh, go back to a very early phase in the history of the universe that we uh, refer to as cosmic inflation when uh, the, um, the universe was dominated by a quantum field that caused the universe to inflate for a very brief period of time and seeded the universe with quantum fluctuations that were then amplified by the uh, action of dark matter to produce this amazing pattern of hot and cold spots that we see in the microwave background radiation today. So these are, if you like, the initial conditions for the formation of, um, of cosmic structure. And um, uh, then um, as uh, Lee Chap uh, pointed out, they are the progenitors of everything we see in the universe today, in particular galaxies. So how do we go from these initial conditions to the universe of galaxies today? Well, uh, the best way to do that is through a technique known as computer simulations. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you how you make a computer simulation. So uh, the idea then is that um, uh, we know the initial conditions. If we make some assumption about the content of the universe, for example, that the dark matter is called dark matter, uh, we now know the initial conditions. And all we need to really do is solve the relevant equations of physics, which we, which we know. Uh, and if we're only interested in the evolution of dark matter, the relevant equations are something called the collision of Boltzmann equation, uh, the Poisson equation that um, I think Gary had amongst his equations, if I remember correctly, uh, just describes how uh, gravity uh, is produced by uh, matter, and then the Friedman equations, which describe how the universe evolves. So the, all you need to do if you want to see, study the evolution of dark matter is solve these three equations. If you're interested in more complicated phenomena involving variants and involving visible stars and so on, then the problem gets a bit more complicated. But today I'm only going to tell you about the easy part of the problem, which is understanding the evolution of dark matter. So you program a computer with, uh, the, to solve these equations, which I always say is much more efficient than trying to program students to solve the equations because the computers work seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and um, they don't usually make mistakes, although they do crash from time to time. So you program the computer, teach it to solve these equations, and then uh, go back and see what comes out of the uh, computer. Now, so this is a subject that goes back, uh, in fact, to the 1980s, uh, well, even to the 1970s. Uh, and here uh, is a picture of some of the first cosmological simulations where um, it was clear uh, already, uh, God, I can't believe this, um, gonna be nearly 40 years ago, uh, I'm not that old, I promise. I, I guess I, I was slightly precautious, but in any case, so this simulation showed that uh, the universe, the dark matter could not be made of neutrinos uh, with a mass of a few tens of electro volts because the distribution of galaxies predicted in that case doesn't look anything like the galaxy distribution that we know, that we knew about way back in the 1980s where uh, we only knew uh, the distribution of about 2,500 galaxies that you see here contrast that with the plot that Lichter showed about this, of the Sloan survey, which has now uh, two or three million galaxies. But it became clear very soon that what's now become the standard model of cosmology, so-called lambda CDM, where lambda is the dark energy part and CDM is called dark matter, that looked a lot more like the observation. So this has been known since 1985. And uh, since then, a lot of tests have been done of this model 
that has now become the standard model of cosmology. Now, the subjects have advanced enormously from these simulations that had 32,768 particles to simulations today, we're just about to do one with several trillion particles. And um, uh, here you see uh, the result of this very long program of uh, simulations over many decades, uh, showing the distribution of dark matter of many scales from galactic uh, uh, halos to galaxy clusters and um, to what we know as the cosmic web and even to the universe as a whole. So um, thanks to this technique of uh, simulation, I think it's fair to say that the dark matter problem is a solved problem <clears throat> in the Lambda CDM cosmology. We know everything about the properties uh, of the dark matter distribution on all scales in CDM. So this is one of those problems that's solved and which doesn't happen very often. Now, so I'm going to show you now a movie that illustrates how these fluctuations that Leach had talked about, these go back to quantum fluctuations during inflation, how they evolve to produce a halo like the one in which the Milky Way lives, uh, the kind of halos that Gary uh, told you about. So what you see here is a, a movie that um, in what we call co-moving coordinates. So the expansion of the universe has been subtracted out. Here's the clock. Uh, and here, these are sort of the, almost the quantum fluctuations that I'm talking about. And they're going to be amplified by gravity pulling matter together in something that we know as gravitational instability, because these fluctuations are unstable to gravity. If you have a, a piece of uh, uh, universe where the dark matter is slightly denser than elsewhere, well, it's denser, so it produces an excess of gravitational force that attracts more matter, which makes it even more massive, uh, and then uh, they're producing more gravity, and then accumulating more and more mass. So this is an instability that leads to the collapse of structures through these very amazing phases that um, uh, are uh, something we call the um, cosmic web. And you see blobs appearing, you see these blobs merging with other blobs, making larger and larger objects. It's called hierarchical clustering, uh, where uh, driven by this gravitational instability. You see a beautiful example here. Uh, all these blobs are merging together because of the excess gravity of the biggest blob in the middle. Now it's got big, so it's going to attract even more matter and it's going to get even bigger and bigger and bigger. So <clears throat> this is the way in which a structure forms in the dark matter. And eventually, uh, when all this activity uh, cools down, when the universe is a few billion years old, then the conditions are there for gas to cool and condense and turn into stars and make a galaxy at the center of this halo. So I'm going to stop the movie here because of lack of time. But uh, let me show you a, a, a journey <clears throat> that um, uh, through the universe today, now this is the present day universe, show you what you would be able to see if you were uh, had uh, dark matter glasses and you could travel at uh, many, many times the speed of light. This is from something called the Millennium Simulation. And um, uh, you see that um, uh, out of these quantum fluctuations came this amazing set of uh, collection of structures. These are all halos of different scales arranged in uh, a very interesting pattern. This is what we know as the cosmic web, characterized by the presence of large filaments uh, that uh, surround relatively under dense regions. And then at the intersection of the filaments, these big objects uh, form. These would hold not galaxies, but galaxy clusters. These would have galaxies. This is a galaxy cluster, like the one that Gary talked about uh, earlier on this evening. <clears throat> so this is what the distribution of dark matter would look like uh, if you could see it. Uh, of course, we don't see that. We only see the galaxies that form in them. Now, so one of the um, surprising results that have come out of um, this program is that even though the formation of a dark matter halo, as you saw in the previous video, is very, very messy and there's all sorts of activity going on, it turns out that uh, the structure of these halos is disarmingly simple. So if you plot the um, uh, density profile, so it's the density as a function of radius, then you find that, that regardless of the mass of the halo from those of dwarf galaxies, I'm gonna see it's even more than that, to galaxy clusters, they're all described by a very simple scaling formula. Uh, and if instead of plotting this in uh, physical units, we plot it in dimensionless units, then the density profiles of all these halos collapse to a single uh, universal function, which is given by this very simple formula. And um, it's also known as the NFW profile, where the density diverges like one over R towards the center, it's called a cusp, and then falls off like one over R cubed in the outer parts. So it's quite remarkable that in spite of all this messy assembly, all the halos are described by a simple universal density profile. 
And as we shall see in a minute, this is very important because it allows us to try to test whether these theories are correct. Now I live in Durham and here in Durham, uh, uh, everybody knows that uh, the right answer is this NFW profile so much so that you can see it here projected on the facade of Durham Cathedral. And this is not Photoshop, this actually happened uh, at a festival of light that we had here some years ago. Now, so here's a plot that um, looks slightly squiggly and not very impressive. It's one of the most impressive plots that I've seen in my scientific career. Uh, and because this shows the number of dark matter halos that we expect in the universe as a function of their mass. It's called the mass function. So this gives you the number uh, of dark matter halos uh, as a function of their mass. And what's remarkable is the number of um, orders of magnitude that you see here. So there are uh, over 20 orders of magnitude uh, in the x-axis from galaxy clusters that have 10 to the 15 solar masses all the way to objects uh, of the size of the Earth uh, that have 10 to the minus six solar masses. So this is the result of work that um, uh, was just published by these people in Nature just a few months ago. And it actually took us seven years of work to be able to do simulations spanning this huge dynamic range. And the result is pretty spectacular. It shows that the mass function, the number of halos function of mass is a perfect power law uh, all the way to very large masses where it cuts off exponentially just because there hasn't been enough time in the universe to grow even bigger structures. So the fact that this is just this beautiful power law uh, is clearly telling us something very profound perhaps, or it may be just telling us that gravity is scale free and it's a simple uh, law of nature. But uh, the result I think is quite remarkable. Now let me tell you how we obtained it because doing a simulation uh, over 25 orders of magnitude in mass is not for the faint-hearted and it's not something that you can just do uh, uh, in a downloading some piece of code and running it. So we worked very hard over seven years to do this and the uh, strategy that we adopted is here. So we had a big simulation, a typical cosmological simulation. Here's the size, the scale bar. And so what we realized, of course, is we couldn't simulate um, um, all the way down to Earth mass if we tried to simulate a, a typical patch of universe. Instead, what we did was to go to a region of low density because there are no big objects here and all the computing time goes in calculating the evolution of the big object. So we went to a region, an under dense region and we simulated that region with a hundred times more resolution than the original one. So the characteristic objects that you see here are galaxy clusters of mass 10 to the 14 solar masses. If you now look at that region, then that's what it looks like. And now the characteristic masses here are only 10 to the 12 solar masses. So we found another low density region with no big objects. So we could simulate it in a reasonable amount of time with a hundred times better resolution. Uh, and we did that. Uh, here, the biggest objects are 10 to the nine solar masses. Now the scale here is one parsec uh, and we keep going of, of more and more levels here. The typical mass is 10 to the six solar masses. Here is now just 10 to the three solar masses. And now the scale here is kiloparsecs and we keep going. Uh, these objects here are 10 to the 10 solar masses. Um, uh, no, sorry, 10 solar masses. This one is uh, a tenth of a solar mass. These objects are a tenth of a solar mass. Uh, we keep going. Now these are 10 to the minus four solar masses. And now we're talking about parsecs here. And then our final zoom finally allowed us to get to objects which have the size of the Earth. So these are dark matter halos of Earth mass. And look at how bizarre the distribution of dark matter looks on these very, very tiny scales. But now we know, uh, and that's why I told you earlier that the dark matter is a dark soul problem. Uh, we now know we can calculate the structure of these halos. And another remarkable result is that this NFW profile uh, extends all the way to Earth mass. So here's a plot that shows now not the density profile, but the derivative, the slope of the profile. And it shows that this NFW formula gives a good match to the data to an accuracy of about 20% or so. So this amazing regularity in the universe, both in the number of uh, halos, its power law, and also in their, uh, its, its structure. So in my last minute or two, I just want to tell you, well, here we have predictions. This is about the most fundamental prediction that Lambda CDM makes for the late universe. Uh, and um, so how do we test it? How do we know Lambda CDM is the correct theory? Well, this offers uh, the opportunity to do tests of the theory. And actually Gary already anticipated uh, what I'm about to tell you, uh, the first thing you want to do is to see, can I observe somehow this, um, this mass function? Well, it's not easy because it's only this little bit. 
uh, here from 10 to the 10 solar masses and above that makes visible galaxies. So visible galaxies don't form everywhere. They only form in the most massive halos. And that's just because these are too small for gas to fall into them and, and for the um, galaxy potential well to trap the gas. So these are completely dark. The only visible galaxies in the universe are, happen on halos of 10 to the 10 solar masses and above. We just sample this tiny little bit of the mass function. So, so look at all these orders of magnitudes that we still have over here. But uh, you can do this test. Oh, sorry. So then this part of the uh, mass function, you can test. I'm going to tell you how detail in a second uh, using the uh, techniques of gravitational lensing that uh, Gary introduced and Licha expanded upon. Uh, and this part can be tested with annihilation radiation that also Gary talked about. So let me tell you a little bit about that. So first, the easy test, which is looking at the visible part of the universe. So here is a plot that shows the observed number of galaxies here in green, uh, sorry, in black, in this histogram as a function of mass compared to the predictions of computer simulations that now include baryons as well. I didn't tell you much about that, but this green comes from uh, computer simulations with baryons. And you can see that we can make a perfectly good account of the number of faint galaxies and bright galaxies as well that we see in the universe. So that part of the test uh, gets a tick mark, um, but now we're in the much harder regime where we just don't see the halos. At least they don't have galaxies in them, uh, but Gary already anticipated and, and so did Licha that we can actually see these. Astronomers are very good at looking in the dark uh, by the technique of gravitational lensing. Uh, it was very nicely explained already. I'll just remind you uh, this is a particularly interesting case where the source of light, the lens, which in this case a galaxy cluster, and the observer are lined up. If the alignment is perfect, uh, the situation is completely symmetric, and that gives rise to these amazing structures that the Hubble Space Telescope discovered called Einstein rings, where um, uh, look at this one here, it's just a perfect ring because there's perfect alignment between the source, the lens, and the observer. Now, what we're interested in is these small little objects here, these uh, halos of mass less than 10 to the 10 solar masses, they too produce gravitational lensing, but a lot less than the big lens. Uh, but what they do is that they distort the image of the Einstein ring. So here's this Einstein ring produced by a galaxy cluster. And then there's a small distortion produced by one of these intervening small halos. Now this one is not interesting because you can actually see the galaxy there. So this uh, halo has uh, more than 10 to the 10 solar masses. We already know those are right. So, but it just illustrates the kind of distortions except you wouldn't be able to see the galaxy and the distortion would be much smaller if the object you're interested in has say 10 to the seven or 10 to the eight solar masses. But in principle, uh, that uh, test can be done and there are people all over, all over the world, including in my own institute, working very hard using these ideas to see whether the universe really does have the predicted number of dark matter halos less than 10 to the 10. But the technique peters out at about 10 to the seven because it's just not sensitive enough. And then finally, to finish off, all this part of the mass function, we can probe with the technique that Gary indicated uh, in his talk uh, of annihilation radiation. So uh, the idea here is that if the dark matter is a particular type of particle called a Majorana particle, then the particles are the same as the antiparticles. So the matter and antimatter are the same thing. And in regions of high density, like for example, at the centers of galaxies, uh, then they uh, collide, they annihilate. And if the masses are of uh, GeV, order of GeV, they produce gamma rays. So Gary explained that. Uh, and um, just to finish off, uh, of course, you need to know the density profile of the halos that comes into this uh, formula that gives you the intensity of the radiation. You need to know something about particle physics, particularly the cross section. But then you need to know the density, of course, because uh, it's an annihilation. This is a two body problem, particles colliding with one another. So this is where the NFW formula becomes very important because it allows you to predict what the uh, gamma ray luminosity should be. And um, just an interesting result from this Nature paper that I say is just a, a couple of months old is that uh, here you see a plot of the luminosity, annihilation luminosity as a function of halo mass. And uh, you can see that halos of all masses from 10 to the 10 all the way to about 10 to the minus uh, six or so, they um, uh, uh, 10 to minus four actually, they produce more or less the same annihilation luminosity. But as we saw, there are many, many more of these than there are of those. So a prediction here is the annihilation luminosity should be dominated by these earth mass clumps of dark matter that are everywhere. Uh, and so uh, there are, as Gary indicated, um, uh, space missions and ground-based missions 
that will be searching for these signals that you can see predicted here. So let me conclude then uh, uh, the evolution of the dark matter distribution in CDM and the abundance and structure of dark matter halos is well understood. It's a solved problem in physics, just like nuclear physics, solved. Um, now, but um, uh, the solution is quite interesting. The mass function of dark matter halos uh, from uh, the Earth mass, 10 to the minus six solar masses to 10 to the 15, it's a power law with an exponential cutoff. Uh, halos of collisionless dark matter of all masses have this universal NFW density profile. And uh, this halo mass function and the structure of halos can in principle be tested observationally. So there's every prospect that in the next few years, even while we wait for experimentalists to finally detect the dark matter, we might be able to test in a very profound way whether this theory is actually correct. And if it isn't, we should be able to rule it out. Okay, so I've stopped here. I think I may have talked for more than 10 minutes, but apologies for that, but uh, I'm done. Thank you so much, Carlos. It's amazing, it's incredible that you spent seven years building up that simulation. And uh, just the power of the computer that you must have used, oh, gosh, yes, incredible. And hopefully over the next few years, um, as you say, we will find evidence that, that does justify your um, plot. Yeah, and does show that trend that you were showing us. Um, we, we are running over our time limit, but we have been getting some questions on Mentimeter. So I will um, post them in the chat so you can see them and I'll also read them out um, for everyone. Um, so our first question um, was, what do you think about the modified Newtonian dynamics can we be 100% sure that dark matter can be explained using particle physics? Yes, no, sorry. <laughs> there we go, next question. I have, I have a, a few slides about that. If I can share my screen. Yeah, yes, go on, Gary. <laughs> can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. yes. All right, so here I go. So um, the, the issue is um, when there's a problem with, uh, with the theory uh, of mass, you could either say that you need extra mass or you, or you might need to modify the theory. So back in uh, 1846, the perturbations of Uranus led to dark matter, which was another planet, which was Neptune. And uh, as uh, predicted by Le Verrier and Adams and, and, uh, and detected by uh, a person called Gal. Later, uh, Le Verrier noticed that there was a precession of Mercury. And for this, uh, he could not understand it from the motions of the other planets. And so he also proposed dark matter. He proposed another planet called Vulcan, which he named Vulcan. Okay. Because you see, there's a difference of uh, 7% in the between the observed and the predicted uh, if, uh, precession of Mercury around the sun. So it has a non-circular orbit and you can measure its precession. And then Einstein came around and said, well, with relativity, I predict that there should be a precession and, and, and the numbers just worked out to predict the precession. So that was nice. So, that, so this was a case where you didn't want to do dark matter, you wanted to use modified gravity. So in the same spirit, an Israeli uh, scientist called Mordechai Milgor, he said that uh, the spiral rotation curves and all their details, their wiggles and all that could be explained without dark matter with a very simple law, all right, which he first developed without relativity, where at low accelerations, the force is no longer mass times acceleration, but mass times acceleration squared over some constant. Okay. And then he would produce things very well. Not only reproduce uh, galaxy rotation curves very well, but in the cases where they didn't reproduce them, it was later found that the distances to these galaxies were wrong. And when it was corrected for the distance, it would produce them very well. And he could also check that his predictions were consistent with the colors of the galaxies. It was very remarkable. However, there are many problems with MOND, all right? So I list uh, some of them here. One is that uh, a scientist at, uh, in my lab called Daniel Charbal was the first to show that in clusters of galaxies, you need dark matter um, to explain the, the mass profiles. That means if you just assume the Mond theory, then you get a, 
a hole in the density profile. The, in the inner regions would be less dense than the outer regions, which makes no sense. Uh, secondly, as I mentioned, the bullet cluster would be inconsistent with Mond because Mond says that the mass is where you uh, is not made of dark matter, right? So the only mass left is the mass in stars and the mass in the hot gas. And the I, t I told you that the mass in the hot gas dominates and the Mond people agree with that. But the gravitational lensing tells us that the mass is not where the hot gas is, it's outside. Because what happens is that the two clusters merged and the dark matter goes right through each other, it's collisionless, but the gas is collisional. So when two blobs of gas uh, go, try to go through each other, they shock heat. They shock, they heat, but they don't pass through each other very well. So they slow down. So there's a decoupling between the galaxies which are more like collisionless systems and the dark matter. And so actually the galaxies and the dark matter are coupled and the hot gas. So this is a big problem for the for Mond. The third issue is that uh, the angular fluctuation spectrum of the cosmic microwave background that uh, Alicia showed you with the wiggles, there was a big wiggle, a big top wiggle, and then there were a couple of other ones. Well, the third one is uh, too high to be explained uh, without dark matter. You really need the dark matter. And the fourth is that there's no, there's been a lot of work by several people um, to build a, a, a generalization of Mond to be consistent with uh, general relativity in the limits of high acceleration. And uh, there was a, a scientist in my laboratory called uh, Gilles Posito Fares who showed that the best theories, relativistic theories of Mond were unstable to any type of perturbation. So, I am a little bit um, skeptical of Mond. I know that there's some people in France who are very famous, like Francois Combe, who, who still accept the idea, and they don't, they're not sold to it. So I think it's good that we keep it as an option, but most people um, don't think very much of it. So I'll stop there for that question. Thank you. Thank you. So, so you say you don't personally agree with it, but how, how long until you disregard a theory what what evidence? What more evidence do you need to discount Mond's theory, or to take it forward, and um, for more scientists to take it more seriously? Well, usually the the question is when the proponents die off and no one, <laughs> no other proponents uh, are there, then you know, then uh, you have a consensus, right? So so far, the proponents of Mond are still uh, loudly uh, waving their flags. And, um, and they came up with other ideas and every idea they came up with, uh, in particular one called uh, the, the relation between acceleration and mass um, was uh, disproven, or it's not that it was disproven, it's that it was reproduced with classical gravity when you add the, the complicated physics of baryons, which are dissipative, which create stars, which might explode, which have black holes in the centers, which might throw out uh, huge mass outflows. This is something that Carlos knows much better than I do. and. Uh, and so, uh, as far as I know, this is not a problem for uh, cold dark matter. It's worth pointing two things out. One is Einstein didn't invent general relativity to, to explain the perihelium of Mercury, he invented general relativity uh, for other considerations, and it just happened to explain this phenomenon, unlike uh, modified gravity that was invented by Milgram to account for a particular observation. So I think just philosophically uh, and methodologically, I think that's not the way to do physics. You know, if you do physics, but you have the laws of physics, and then you try to see how far you can go, and you, should, you don't give them up uh, cheaply just because something disagrees. So um, and I, I think, um, I mean, there's only very few people working in Mond in, in the world, and um, many of them are, many of them, they're not many, but some of them are quite young, so they're not gonna die anytime soon, I don't think. So I think Mond will keep rattling around at the margins of the subject, uh, really um, ignored by the vast majority of the cosmological community. I think it doesn't really stand the chance that this uh, idea of being correct. Is it uh, oh, just sorry. before like, uh, we probably should move on to another question, but why do you think people are still, even though there's so much evidence for dark matter, why do you think people are still sort of sticking to Mond? This is sort of like a lack of, like proof of dark matter or like the lack of tests? Why do you think people are still sort of it's trying to keep this theory going? It's a sort of psychological and um, sociological question. So, so I mean, uh, scientists are, well, you're like the rest of the population, we're, but we're probably at the tail of the distribution of eccentricity. 
So we like to be eccentric and some are more eccentric than others. And um, some people think, uh, well, um, they get enamored of an idea and I think they abandon the true uh, code of science, which is that you have to be objective and you have to look at the evidence. So that's my explanation. I, I don't make many friends when I say this kind of thing, but I think it is true. So it is, you know, just human nature that people who are very obstinate <laughs> But uh, I would like I would add that there is a value in thinking a little bit outside the established paradigm of this uh, model that we have with with dark matter and dark energy uh, and a cosmological constant, because uh, at least if, if, if in, in cosmology and in astronomy we don't make experiment we just make observation and therefore our observation is seen already with the lens of the theory behind. So it's always good if somebody keeps you on your toes and make you question how much of the model am I using to then go back to the same model and how much of the statement and the measurement and the deduction that I'm making are model independent and they still push me towards that model. So in one case, one is doing parameter fitting, and in the other case, one is really trying to connect, uh, you know, the, the physical quantity with the physical meaning of the model, which are two slightly different things. So it's uh, it has a value. I'm not saying that uh, I would recommend my students to work on that, but I certainly recommend my student to try to sometimes to think uh, outside this, the, 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 the standard model and see, you know, whether you are really pushed again into the, into the model or not. I agree with Leach. I mean, it's always good to have a minority of people who are outside the mainstream. I mean, I, I was one of those. So when I started working on cold dark matter, I was told very clearly that if I wanted to have a future in science, the sooner I gave up this cold dark matter craziness, the, the better, because it was a completely crazy idea. So I agree that having uh, a group of people who are outside the mainstream uh, and um, like to speculate on possibilities is good, so long as the group is very small. Uh, and they, they can be honest, yes, but... <laughs> <laughs> but the other thing is, you know, uh, 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 not buying into MOND doesn't necessarily mean that you are 100% sure that dark matter can be explained using particle physics. There is uh, one uh, good thing that we know is that we have seen dark matter. The neutrinos have a mass and therefore, and they are dark and they count like dark matter. Unfortunately, neutrinos are not cold. And therefore, they don't fit the bill to explain the observation that we see them. But we, we have seen at least one component of dark matter. And indeed, it can be explained by particle physics. So, you know. Well, I think the cold dark matter theory is just so, uh, gives you, I didn't, we didn't talk about this, but, but you did to some extent with the microwave background, but which assumes cold dark matter, that beautiful plot that Alicia showed with the acoustic oscillations. That is based on cold dark matter. But if you look at the galaxy distribution, I didn't show you plots of that. It's just so realistic that um, um, I think the evidence is now compelling that right. the dark matter has to be, if it's not cold dark matter, it definitely has to look a lot like cold dark matter. It needs to be cold or looks a lot like cold. It needs to be dark and it needs to be weakly interacting. Yes. I think people will, will stop talking about other theories when we detect dark matter particles. So this is, the, this is the main roadblock, all right? So, um, and then is there, is there, there's something I don't understand, but maybe I'm wrong. Could there be just one type of dark matter particle or, or several? Well, the, the, the big nice let's say neutrinos, all right? Uh, 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 let's say among cold dark matter particles, could there be several living together? Yes. Yes. I'll tell you what the nightmare is. Uh, and I do get nightmares about this sometimes, from time to time that the dark matter is undetectable. There are, there are particles in supersymmetry that just interact through gravity and nothing else. So they're by definition undetectable except through gravity. Mm -hmm. and then, then we're in, in a difficult situation. Yes. I hope not. I mean, I hope they do interact a little bit uh, with other things so they can be detected, but um, they could turn out to be undetectable. 
or they may interact so little that they are undetectable, not by an ideal experiment, but by uh, any realistic experiment. Yeah, exactly. Then we end up uh, with the Russell Teapot uh, <laughs> case in philosophy. Yeah. So what are the current steps um, being taken to identify dark matter particles then? Well, um, Gary just mentioned, so the, the first thing is to try to discover them in the laboratory. That really would be the jewel in the crown. If somebody came with a cold dark matter particle and showed it to me in my office, then I'll be completely convinced, of course. So there's uh, lots of groups in the world. We had a very, in fact, that whole technique or approach and the technology to detect dark matter particles was originated in the UK in the 1980s. Uh, by um, some, somebody called, um, what was his first name, uh, Peter Smith. So the idea is to have a laboratory experiment where you have a very sensitive detector, and then you try to uh, see, well, there are various techniques, but in essence, you try to see when a dark matter particle coming from the halo of the Milky Way hits an atom in your detector and makes it recoil a little bit. And by various techniques, you try to measure that recoil so there was an experiment here, not far from where I live in the Bowlby mine in the Northeast of England, where uh, this was a working mine. And at the bottom of the mine, there was this very advanced physics experiment trying to detect dark matter. So unfortunately the UK um, research agencies withdrew the funding. And now this is being taken up by groups in, in the US, um, other groups in Europe and uh, in China, Australia uh, and, and India. So. Now that's one technique, it's called direct detection. There's another technique, which is the one Gary explained and I talked a bit about as well, which is to look at what's known as indirect detection, where you look at the products of annihilation of dark matter particles, but that only works if the dark matter is this Majorana type uh, particle that it's its own antiparticle. So they annihilate. So that's also uh, another way to try to look for it. And um, the third technique is what I was talking about of using astrophysics and in particular, if, um, if it was possible to show that nature has exactly the right number of dark matter halos of all masses as predicted by the theory, to me, that's as good as detecting the particle. But it could be also other things. It could be axions, for example, and then there are experiments trying to look for axions like dark matter. Or for a brief moment, we all thought that maybe it could be black holes. <laughs> and then this hope is vain. A yes. little constraints are getting a little bit tighter. So, so yeah, there's plenty of opportunity for all you young guys to get involved in this because, um, as you can see, we don't really know what the particle is. Uh, we tried to look for it, but um, not, not successfully so far. Uh, and that's only the dark matter. We didn't talk about dark energy. That's another world of, of big question mark. So, so there's plenty of um, opportunities here for young. Um, physicists to get involved in, I, I think there's few things more exciting in life than um, uh, trying to detect the dark matter. I mean, I mean, in scientific life, I don't mean in life as a whole. Although personally, <laughs> I think it is true of life as a whole as well. But I don't expect all of you to share that view, but certainly from a scientific point of view, it's one of the most important unsolved open questions in science today. Oh, of course, it's very exciting in a life perspective. But, uh... <laughs> yeah, such an unknown bit of physics to be solved. I was wondering, uh, I saw, um, I was wondering, because we were talking about WIMPs and axioms, is there a preferred, if you had a pref, like, I'm not sure you can have a preference for uh, science, but which model for dark matter, so WIMPs or axioms, are you most convinced of? I don't know, Gary, what do you think? <laughs> well, I went to a meeting in um, 2003, and I was listening to someone talking about the detection of WIMPs and, and uh, supersymmetric particles at the time was uh, supersymmetric WIMPs. And he said there are a million free parameters and he was showing some uh, ex exclusion curves. And I asked him, when, when will it be that we will have eliminated half the models? He said in six years. And, um, and that was in 2003. So now the exclusion has gone down and now supersymmetry seems to be out of the picture. And um, so 
Now, it doesn't have to be super symmetric uh, WIMPs, but it seems to me that axons are becoming more popular these days. Axons are light dark matter particles compared to the massive ones. Yeah, I, I don't think supersymmetry is out, it's out, um, it's ruled out. I no. mean, what, what, what is ruled out? So the dark matter particle could still be, so supersymmetry could still, so, so what Gary is saying is that um, you all know about CERN, right? And the experiments at CERN that are trying yes. to detect supersymmetry and they have failed so far. But um, what that tells you is that um, the, the simplest models of supersymmetry are ruled out, <clears throat> but there's no reason why the simplest models should be the truth. And the other thing it tells you is that the scale of supersymmetry could be much uh, at much higher energies than LHC has been able to probe. So, um, so for example, if they're TeV instead of GeV, then that is still perfectly viable. And so the dark matter could still be a supersymmetric particle, but it wouldn't be a GeV particle. It would be TeV or something much more energetic than has been seen in the LHC. But I don't think supersymmetry is ruled out yet. The standard supersymmetry, yes, and I agree with Gary that uh, there's a lot of gloom uh, and doom amongst um, particle physicists, both uh, theoretical and experimental. But I think that gloom and doom is um, justified because supersymmetry could still exist at a higher energy. But supersymmetry is only, as Gary says, only one possibility that many, many other um, theories of particle physics that predict WIMPs. So I, I personally don't have any preference between WIMPs and axions, uh, so long as they're detectable. And most importantly, somebody, so long as somebody takes them, uh, I, I would um, be happy. Whoever gets the Nobel Prize, somebody who detects a WIMP or somebody who detects an axion, uh, I'll be equally happy and I'll hope they invite me to the party. <laughs> well, yeah, any good news, any for dark matter being found in any form is obviously great news for uh, cosmologists. Um, just a quick question from the audience. Um, they wanted to know uh, what axioms were one second, I forget the exact question. Uh, can you explain what axions are and how they might be a dark matter candidate? I know this is more of a particle physics question than a cosmology question. But. Sure, I don't know, maybe whoever wants to explain it, I mean, I'm, I can do it, but Leach, I'm sure, can do it as well, and Gary, whoever wants to, I'm talking more than them, so let them explain it. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Leach or Gary, I guess. <clears throat> So uh, the, the axion, it's, you know, an hypothetical uh, uh, particle that come out of uh, the, the particle physics that uh, was uh, uh, initially proposed for something else to solve some other problem. But then it turns out that, yes, it could be a, a dark matter particle. And uh, uh, in some cases, you could even have uh, the action in a magnetic field being coupled to the photons, but not if it's not in a strong magnetic field. So in principle, you could try to see uh, light get uh, becoming an axion and then becoming light again, and therefore seeing light passing through walls or, you know, uh, see that in your detector a photon turns into something else and you lose it or something like that. And so there are experiments that goes on in to find uh, particles like this. Now, it's not necessarily that if they fit the bill for the dark matter, they fit the bill for explaining also uh, the original uh, uh, phenomena that they were introduced. But once the genie is out of the bottle, then, you know, theories run, run wild and you may as well go and try to measure it and see who's right. Yeah, just to add one thing. So, so, so you might wonder, well, why, why can supersymmetry, I was talking at supersymmetry about TeV, the mass of an axion is 10 to the minus five EV. So how come they behave the same <clears throat> as these very massive particles? And the, 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 the thing about the axions is that they're they're like Bose-Einstein condensates and they are born out of equilibrium. So they're not even in thermal equilibrium with the rest of the universe. So they're, they're never, so that's what they're called. They're essentially born with very- Born cold. Born cold, yeah. They, weren't, they didn't turn cold by being coupled to radiation. They were just born like that. Uh, and so that's why they do exactly the same. So from the point of view of the formation of structure in the universe that are indistinguishable from, um, from, from the supersymmetric or the other wind particles, even though the masses is at orders of magnitude uh, uh, smaller. Now they say a particular kind of axion, uh, 
uh, which is something called fuzzy dark matter, but um, that's maybe a bit too um, far off to be discussing tonight. But uh, yes, so there are plenty of opportunities still for cold dark matter to exist somewhere. Awesome, thank you. Um, another question, and I think it may have to be our last um, focus, uh, because we are definitely pushing our time limit now, um, <laughs> just because everyone's so interested. Um, what do you think the timeline for dark matter research is? Um, when do you think um, we'll know what it is? How, yeah, when, when is it hoped that we'll have detected particles by? And then also, just the future of your individual research is it would be really interesting to hear what your next steps are. Okay, I definitely have the answer to the first question. <coughs> yeah, the answer <laughs> question is that uh, it will be, dark matter will be detected in, in the next five years. Mind you, I've been saying that for the last 25. <laughs> so that's my answer to that question. I don't know what the other two think. Uh, I don't think there is a, uh, apart from Carlos, who's very convinced about his time scale, I don't think anybody has a time scale for that. Uh, it's true that uh, most of the, the experiment that uh, require big detector are getting sort of at the limit of what they can do. But, uh, you know, there are other ways around, so. I wouldn't put a, a timeline on that. Yeah, I agree with you. Jen. But if you ask the average cosmologist, and I'm in that category, uh, what they're you know they're most interested in, they would say you know dark energy because you know dark matter at least is matter. So eventually somebody will find it. We understand it, but dark energy is not even matter. So you know everybody will actually say they want to understand dark energy. No, um, not, no I, I want to understand it, but I much sooner understand dark matter than dark energy. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Um, so uh, my focus in the past few years has been, apart from you know analyzing ga a large galaxy survey, because now it's a bit of the boom, the the golden era of a galaxy survey. It's uh, to ask oneself what one can say about the universe that does not rely on assuming a model like a lambda CDM model. So going from parameter fitting, I give you the model and just tell me what the parameter of the model are to uh, I give you the universe and the physics. What can you tell me about what is the meaning of the quantity that you measure rather than the next significant figure on a parameter of a model? So um, I will, uh, I will since I have the slides, I will show one pet project I was involved in, which is a little bit dormant now, which is how to test dark matter as we know it. And um, so this is called the Theia project. Carlos has heard me talk about this briefly. Yeah. And um, yeah. And um, that, that's interesting. So kind of working physics in a slightly different. Way. So. So one prediction of dark matter is that it should be cuspy, especially in uh, systems where there's very few baryons. And, and I said that the very low mass galaxies uh, apparently have huge mass to light ratios. And so they're completely dominated by dark matter, but they're very difficult to observe. And so one idea is to be able to measure the motions of the stars along the in projection on the sky, which we call proper motions. And it's very difficult to do for objects that are far away. And, and, um, and even these tiny galaxies are a little bit too far away to do today. But tomorrow we might be able to do it with an astrometric uh, uh, project like the one we have here called Theia, where we want to do uh, astrometry, get positions on the sky much better than what we're doing with a state-of-the-art project today called Gaia. So with proper motions, when you do um, modeling the internal motions with neutrons methods, if you want, um, Usually we have only line of sight uh, velocities from redshifts, but when you add proper motion, it helps a lot. Okay, so that's what this plot shows. Okay, so the red does much better in matching the black, which is the, the true data than the blue curves. 
Another prediction of, of, of dark matter, as, uh, as we've been talking about and Carlos talked about, is, this, is that there should be subhalos in our Milky Way. And these subhalos should cross through the disk and they should perturb the disk. And uh, these disk perturbations, they, so they should leave perturbations in the stellar motions of the disk for a few hundred million years. And there should be lots of these little subhalos. And um, Gaia will be able to detect the, the more massive ones, but they'll be very rare. But uh, an, a high astrometric, a high precision astrometric uh, mission like Theia would be able to detect enough of them to be able to avoid confusion with other perturbers. Another method, as, as uh, Carlos mentioned, is also by uh, lensing or gravitation lensing. But we think that, that there'll be more data in the, in the dynamics than in the lensing for the Milky Way. A third idea, a third idea is the shape of the halo because with Lambda CDM, the dark matter halo should be prolate compared uh, relative to the disk of the galaxy. And so one way to test the shape is to measure the, um, the directions of the proper motions of the hypervelocity stars. So what are hypervelocity stars? There are, there are a few dozen uh, stars in there among the 100 billion in the Milky Way, right? There are a few dozen that we know today, which uh, are, are traveling at speeds beyond the escape velocity of, of the Milky Way. And, uh, and so far, we believe that they originate from the galactic center. And the only way to get such high velocity stars, or at least the best way, is to have uh, three body interactions between a pair of stars and a, a supermassive black hole that is known to sit in the center of the Milky Way. So the trajectories that we would measure would measure the shape of the Milky Way potential. So that's the, uh, the, the three ideas of the Theia mission here. Um, so we submitted this to ESA and we, there were 40 propose, proposed missions uh, submitted and, uh, in 2018, and we were in the last 13 round, and, but we didn't make it further than that. And so uh, I think that astrometry is a promising avenue, and I encourage the young people to look into this. Oh, fantastic. It's a real shame it was got cancelled at the very last, uh, well, through the last 13, you just got cancelled by the end of it. Well, we are definitely very much pushing the patience and time of our three guests. Um, it's been fantastic to have you all here. It's been a, it's been very, very interesting and a massive success. I'm, you know, thank you guys for coming. Well, thank you for inviting us. Thank you for inviting us. Yes, it was fun. <laughs> and the travel was not too difficult. <laughs> oh, thank God. <laughs> Put your carbon footprint, Gary. <laughs> all right okay, can i just echo harry's thanks um it was incredible and everyone has so enjoyed it and you had a massive turnout as well which which is incredible so thank you all so much so much for coming bye for now thank okay. you bye, bye. thank yeah. you very much bye.